vault space. And uh, Mike sold uh, one of his companies for $2.6 billion in cash in the uranium space in the last cycle. And um, he's now focused on doing the same thing in the, the nickel space. Mike, welcome up to the podium. Got it. Okay. Thanks. I'm going to talk today, as Colin mentioned, about electric vehicles and uh, implications for the mining and metals industry. In, in my estimation, this is probably the single most important development for our industry since the China-driven super cycle in the early 2000s. And it has implications of unprecedented demand for a, a number of metals that are involved in the fabrication of batteries and also in the construction and assembly of electric vehicles. But um, let me begin first with a, a general dis discussion about what uh, the drivers are for this transition to electrification. And I, I think after this, um, you will agree with me that it's not a question of if, it's just a question of how fast um, the market transitions uh, away from internal combustion engines to um, electric and hybrid vehicles. And we're just seeing the beginnings of it now. So the first driver is regulatory, and it's driven principally by increasingly stringent, um, whoops, sorry increasingly stringent emission standards. And here's a chart that shows the emission standards out through 2025 for uh, four major regions, which constitute really the majority of the passenger vehicle market in the world, the EU, China, Japan, and the US. And the trend line is unmistakable. It's down, and, and the metric here is grams of carbon dioxide per kilometer traveled. And the only way vehicle manufacturers can meet these increasingly stringent emission standards is by increasing the percentage sales of zero emission, i.e. EVs, and low emission, i.e. hybrids, in their fleet sales. So this is a pretty compelling driver, but maybe not as compelling as the next one, which is economic. And the largest um, single cost component of an electric vehicle is the battery pack. It represents, on average, 40% of the cost of the electric vehicle. And to the extent you can reduce the price of the battery pack, i.e. the batteries, you achieve more quickly cost parity with um, ICEs, internal combustion engines. So this is an interesting chart that I, I took from Bloomberg last month, and it's battery prices since 2010, and it's pretty remarkable because battery prices in 2010 averaged $1,200 per kilowatt hour, and at the end of last year, they averaged sub $200 per kilowatt hour. So you had a six-fold reduction in the cost of batteries over an eight-year period, and this trend line is continuing. And most analysts um, agree that once uh, the industry hits $100 per kilowatt hour, and we're not far from that, um, it's sort of game over. At that point, you have cost parity between an electric vehicle and an ICE. And uh, in fact, Tesla, who uses a, a, a rather unique chemistry, NCA, it's higher energy den density than M MC, is reckoned to be at $100 a kilowatt hour now. So the rest of the industry with the NMC chemistry will probably be there in the next 12 to 18 months. And it won't stop at $100 per kilowatt hour. It'll go lower. Um, so at the point you have... Um, um, electric vehicles that cost less to the consumer to purchase and operate um, than an equivalent ICE, it's, it's sort of game over because at that point, no rational consumer would purchase a more expensive and what at that point will be obvious, I think, to mo most obsolete technology. And these crossover points are, are coming quickly. This is a this is a chart that I took from Vali, but, uh, but um, actually Vali took it from a Bank of America research report, and it shows the crossover points for 
a, a number of different jurisdictions. So the first crossover point will be for EU diesel vehicles, and that's reckoned to be in 2021, 2022, so that's not two, two, two and a half years away, followed shortly thereafter by crossover of EU petrol, and then where fuel prices are cheaper because there's less taxation built into the cost of the fuel to the consumer, that's the EU, uh, the US and China, the crossover point is likely to be 2023 to 2024. And at that point, then I think we'll see uh, a rapid and adoption of electric vehicles, uh, again, simply because they're, they're cheaper, they're faster, and they're better, and, and manufacturers increasingly will be emphasizing the production of electric vehicles over ICEs. So, so that's a, a, a second powerful driver, which is basic economics. A third is also economics, and it's from the vehicle manufacturer's perspective. Because electric vehicles have about half, and in some cases less than half, the components of an ICE, it turns out, not surprisingly, that they're actually much cheaper to build and assemble. So if you look at an EV factory versus an equivalent ICE in terms of number of units, the EV factory is about half the footprint, half the capital cost, requires for vehicle assembly about one third less labor hours, and is more flexible and scalable. So this implies that the manufacturers that move most rapidly to increase their mix of EVs will have a comparative cost advantage over other laggards in the industry. So this is a, another uh, large incentive that's pushing sort of the transition to electrification. So, so really you have three, not just one, but three really um, uh, unquestionable drivers. First, regulatory government mandates. Two, basic economics. It's going to be, in the next couple of years, actually cheaper to buy and operate an electric vehicle. And then three, from the manufacturer's perspective, if that's not enough, it's just actually half the capital cost and, and one-third less the labor that's required. So um, this is going to allow electric vehicles to command an increasingly greater share of the passenger vehicle market. And I'm focused in this discussion just on passenger vehicles, but the same dynamic will, will also take place in commercial vehicles. Um, so in 2017, um, electric vehicles were 1% of the passenger vehicle market. In 2018, last year, they were 3%. And uh, on their way, probably by 2025, to being somewhere between 15 and 25 percent of new passenger vehicle sales. By 2030 to 2035, the majority of passenger vehicle sales are likely to be in the form of electrical vehicles, for all the reasons that were were talked about in the earlier slides. Um, and this is going to lead to. Um, and, and in fact, this is a chart that shows this is the actual growth of uh, electrical vehicle uh, sales since 2011. And you can already see the shape of the curve. Admittedly, off, it's off of a near zero base, but this trend is going to accelerate. And it's, uh, I, I think it will be like smartphones. You had some of the early adopters. Um, for a period of time, and then all of a sudden there was mass adoption, and during an 18-month period, um, you went from 10% of the population to ha having smartphones to 90-plus to percent. And I think we'll see the same sort of adoption curve, uh, slightly different time constant, because it's, it's easier to purchase a smartphone than a new car, but it will be an S, a classic sort of S curve for adoption of the technology. Um, and this has implications for a range of metals. Some of them are listed here uh, because these electric vehicles uh, consume um, um, amounts of a select group of metals um, that have not previously had this demand source. Some of them are listed here. I'm actually in this talk going to focus on the ones that I think are most important, which are lithium, cobalt, nickel, and copper. 
Uh, the last one, copper, is not used so much in the fabrication of batteries, but it's used disproportionately in the fabrication of electric vehicles. Um, interesting factoid, so um, electric vehicles, even though today they represent three plus percent of the passenger vehicle market, which is nothing, already consume more battery capacity than all of the world's tablets, smartphones, and laptops. And one electric vehicle consumes, on average, the equivalent of 10,000 smartphones. So this is really um, dramatic, and um, the impact on uh, this select group of metals will be unprecedented in terms of incremental demand from a new source. So here are some of the, the key metals. I'm, I'm, it's nickel, cobalt, aluminum, and lithium. I'm not gonna talk about aluminum, principally because it's only used in one chemistry, which is the, the Tesla Panasonic chemistry, and so I, 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 the, the, the rest of the industry is really adopting the NMC chemistry. So I'm gonna focus uh, on nickel, um, copper, cobalt, and lithium. Um, this is an interesting chart I, I took from the World Bank. It's just, a, just an indication of the dynamic. The last column, if you just look at that, this is the incremental demand for uh, this group of uh, battery metals and renewable energy metals. And um, through 20, looking at 2050 versus uh, 2017 total world production. And again, the, the numbers are numbers we're not accustomed to seeing in terms of growth of demand in the, in the mining industry. In, in the mining industry, we're accustomed to seeing demand growth more or less in sync with world GDP growth, which is typically two to 4% per annum, not sort of compounded 15 to 20% per annum. So it's a, it's a new paradigm shift for these metals, and it's going to create unprecedented investment opportunities uh, selectively um, that didn't exist previously. So, so I'm just going to quickly talk about um, the four metals in a little bit more detail to give you a flavor. So here's, here's lithium. If you look at the, the chart on the bottom left, the table, and the fourth column in, this is for a mix of, of hybrid and electric vehicles. And the fourth column in is the lithium carbonate. Uh, requirement for each of those models. And if you look at the Tesla Model S, uh, this is the 70 kilowatt model, which is not even the top end. Uh, the top end is the 100 kilowatt hour, but it needs 63 kilograms per vehicle of lithium carbonate. And then the chart on the right um, says, okay, well, if I, if I assume a reasonable mix of of these vehicle types, and I assume a penetration rate of X, how much more mine supply will be required to satisfy this lithium demand? And so the second bar is 15%. Um, so if you assume a 15% penetration rate, the world is going to have to produce 3.6 times total world mine supply. And if you assume a 25%, which is the next bar over, it's six times current world mine supply. And if you assume just as an intellectual exercise that every vehicle sold henceforth is electric, the world needs 25 times total world mine supply. So again, a staggering sort of uh, demand. Um, requirements on this uh, select group of metals. If I look at cobalt, it's kind of the same story, different different um, graph, but this is a graph of projected um, cobalt demand out through 2025, which is not that far away, six years from now. And I believe this assumes a 25% um, penetration rate, i.e. by 2025, one in four, um, vehicles purchased is electric, and it's sort of the same dynamic you see with lithium. The world's going to need five times current world mine supply for cobalt. So uh, these are kind of interesting, but you can say, Mike, uh, that's, um, that's kind of interesting, but these are niche metals, and they are. So the total cobalt market is 110,000 tons a year, and Lithium's maybe twice that, 220,000 tons, but um, show me a real metal 
like nickel or, or copper. So um, this is a complicated chart, and it, it's, it simply is, uh, is setting the stage for the nickel part of the discussion, which is that um, since nickel prices collapsed in 2007, they hit a high of $50,000 a ton and then collapsed and never really recovered. Today they're at $12,000 a ton. Um, there's a structural deficit uh, baked in, and the world has been sort of depleting uh, surplus stocks, and that's coming to an end in the next 18 months. And so when you layer in this incremental demand, which is going to start to ramp up from, from vehicle, electric vehicle sales, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, nickel is probably the most critical component to um, a battery, all of the energy density is stored in the nickel electrons, um, then there's going to be um, an abrupt and uh, shortly um, to be seen um, shortage of nickel units. And, and that's probably going to come in 2021. And this is um, 2021, 2022. And this is sort of um, a different plot of the same sort of thesis. And that is that as electric vehicles start to ramp up and battery production goes up with it, more nickel units will be required and there aren't any in the system. And nickel um, has a very long lead time to bring on new production. It's probably uh, on average seven to 10 years. So if you need class one nickel, which is what's needed for battery fabrication, and you decide to uh, produce more nickel units today from a greenfield or brownfield, you're looking at seven to 10 years before you'll see those new nickel units. Um, this is another chart here of the nickel sort of story. This, this comes from Vale, but it really mirrors um, the numbers, just, it's just that you saw in the previous slides, but just presented a different way. One is an upside case where adoption rate is, is slightly faster of electric vehicles, and the other is a conservative base case rate for EV adoption, but they both tell the same story, which is there is a, a looming shortage um, that is relatively imminent and should manifest itself in the next two to three years. Um, so our favorite metal in sort of the battery mix from an investment uh, standpoint is nickel uh, for, for these reasons. And, and, and an added interesting dynamic is that the, all of the battery makers are, are migrating their chemistries um, as rapidly as possible to try to stuff more um, nickel units into the chemistry. The more nickel you can stick into the battery, the higher the energy density. So this is, this is shaping up to be an interesting and uh, perfect storm. And, and we're, we're still early enough as investors that um, one can position themselves while nickel is down here at $12,000. And, and it wasn't all that long ago that nickel ran to $50,000 a ton. Uh, but the dynamic in terms of shortages and, and the baked in structural deficits are much more severe this time around. So um, I'm going to uh, finish on the last metal, which is interesting. It's copper. Um, a copper uh, market is the largest base metal market. The nickel is 2.1 million tons a year. Um, and, 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 and by the way, I, we don't have the time today, but there's a more nuanced, nuanced story on nickel, and, and that is that nickel is really two different markets. It's class one and class two, and you can only use class one for a battery, so the shortages will be even more acute. But, but copper is a massive market, 24 million tons a year of production. And the chart on the bottom right is interesting. So um, it sets out how many kilograms of copper are used in an average electric vehicle. So in, if you look at the base case, which is the middle column, um, the average um, electric vehicle needs about 83 kilograms of copper. Uh, by the way, uh, that compares to 20 kilograms uh, for the equivalent ICE. So it uses materially more copper than a, an internal combustion engine vehicle. 
But it doesn't stop there because all these EVs have to plug in to get their charge. So that implies the grid's going to have to expand. And if you do make some reasonable assumptions and do some analysis, it turns out that a reasonable assumption is that uh, for every electric vehicle, there'll be another 20 kilograms consumed in an expansion of the grid. And it doesn't stop there. You also need the charging station. And on average, that's another six and a half kilograms. So the average electric vehicle, if you add up those three components, is going to need something on the order of 110 kilograms versus an ICE today, which is 20 kilograms. So this, again, it's kind of the nickel story uh, all over, uh, just a different uh, metal. Um, the world's going to need a lot. This is a new incremental source for copper that never existed in the past. And so this is going to put additional stress on copper supply. And again, copper, like nickel, um, a long lead time to bring new production in. Copper prices have been relatively depressed since 2012, so there hasn't been a lot of new investment in capacity, and you can't turn these things on overnight. So copper is another, I think, interesting uh, positioning uh, for investors, uh, though I think it will take longer to to play out than nickel. Nickel is sort of a story in the next two to three years. Copper is probably a story in the next four to six years. So um, we, we've, the last couple of years, just focused really on this whole EV thematic and try to position ourselves um, with uh, prudent exposure in um, in all of these implicated battery metals. Um, I'll leave the audience with um, one of our positions, which is at the small cap end. It's called Giga Metals. It's a it's a micro cap. Um, you you wouldn't know it, uh, but we we like it. It has a market cap of eight or nine million Canadian dollars. It's an orphan. There's no research. Nobody's heard of it. It's on the TSX, um, but we like it because it owns the world's uh, second largest, uh, albeit low grade, um, nickel sulfide deposit. Um, happens to be in British Columbia. Uh, about 25% of the deposit has been drilled, so arguably um, if it continues, um, and, and there's no plan for additional drilling because there's already 2 billion tons um, in a 43-101, but arguably it may be the largest uh, undeveloped nickel sulfide deposit. And nickel sulfide is the preferred feedstock for class one nickel, and you need class one to produce uh, batteries. Um, we like it because when, if our thesis that nickel is going to move um, turns out to be true, um, then this stock is going to be uh, disproportionately re-rated. It's, it's, it's a classic sort of asymmetric risk reward. The upside is 10 to 20 X. The downside is we get it wrong and the, the stock goes from an 8 million market cap to a four. And um, we look at it from a financial perspective as being the equivalent of buying an undated um, call option on nickel. So, and, and then for the, uh, this is just a small part of the portfolio to, to give it some juice, and then we've got some larger nickel exposure. So, so that's, that's my talk, that's a chart on Giga. It, it's meaningless, you know, it, uh, it, we, we, it's the kind of stock you buy, you just uh, put it in your desk drawer, and if you get your nickel call right, it will uh, return handsomely. If you don't, then you've probably lost uh, half your money and, and it's a lottery ticket on nickel. I think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people. Hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off. Uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?